Welcome to another episode of The National Pulse. I'm Raheem Kassam, Editor-in-Chief of TheNationalPulse.com. It's Tuesday, October the 12th, the year of our Lord, 2021, broadcasting to you from, unfortunately, Capitol Hill in Washington, D.C., fresh off the back of Miami and Ampfest. I'll tell you all about that in the second part of this show. But for the first part, we have a very special guest joining us today. You know, a man who really doesn't need an introduction, especially to this audience. But I'll do it anyway. Dr. Peter Navarro was, frankly, if you ask me, the single most important person in Donald Trump's White House, except Donald Trump himself, at least in the latter years. I'll let... Stephen K. Bannon and Peter Navarro fight it out for the accolade there. But he's also got a new book coming out very soon. And you're going to want to get your pre-orders in for that book. It's called In Trump Time, My Journal of America's Plague Year. And what else is there to do, ladies and gentlemen, apart from bring the man in himself to talk about that and all of the other, frankly, bullshit that we're having to endure day in, day out from this illegitimate regime. Welcome to The National Pulse and welcome to The National Pulse, Dr. Peter Navarro. Thank you for joining us. Hey, Raheem, it's, it's really great to be with you. And before we kind of get into the guts of the In Trump Time book, I want to, uh, I want to, I want to give you and some others... Uh, uh, some kudos here because this book in Trump time got uh, as, as high as uh, rank number three on Amazon. It sold um, or there's demand for over 200,000 copies. People haven't seen anything quite like this. And here's the punchline. I owe this to what I am now formally dubbing today the, the six big guns of truth. Here's the problem, Raheem, and you know this well. If, if you're Bob Woodward, you've got the entire corporate media behind you. You've got the Washington Post, the, the Gray Lady, all of that stuff, pimping, pimping your book. Woodward is all propaganda and lies. Yet the American people, if you look at the public opinion polls, they know the, the virus came from Wuhan. They know that the election was stolen. They know all of these things. And what I attribute it to is what I call the six big guns of truth. The top of this pyramid, or probably the guy, and you would agree with me, the biggest bullet is, is the Bannon's War Room podcast. Yep. But there's the National Pulse with Raheem Kassam and, and your, your trusty lieutenant, Natalie Winters. Uh, you've got uh, Solomon at Just the News. You've got Beatty at Revolver News. You've got the Hoff Brothers at Gateway Pundit. you got Basobic at Human Events. And between these six big guns of truth, um, it's really uh, an incredible effort to push through all the fog of propaganda war uh, of the other side and really get to the truth. And what I'm trying to do in, in Trump time is get to the bottom of November 3rd, get to the bottom of January 6th, get to the bottom of the Wuhan weapons lab. In Trump time, and I, I call it a book of revelations. We're going to find out what happened. Uh, but it's also a book of indictments with... Um, arguably Tony Fauci at the first of the top of the list of the people I want to put in an orange jumpsuit. <laughs> you and me both. And thank you for the, for the, for the great, and I think probably undeserved compliment um, of, of putting us in that, you know, no, no not <laughs> undeserved. Don't underestimate yourself, Raheem. Cause there's something's happening here. My friend, there's something happening here. You get the constant spin from, from CNN, MSNBC, even some of the allegedly conservative networks, it's all BS and propaganda, yet somehow the American people in the polling indicate they know the truth. Mm. That doesn't happen without the National Pulse and Gateway Pundit and the War Room, which you are very much a part of as well. I mean, you were one of the founders of that. So uh, I'm, I'm, I'm you six big guns of truth, baby. Well, I appreciate it. And, uh, you know, uh, look, I, it's very, very disconcerting, put it that way, uh, Dr. Navarro, for for 
a, a, a British guy from a little suburb of West London to be sitting up here on Capitol Hill and hearing from who I think is one of the single most important actors in American politics that somehow I have sway here i mean that's disturbing for me um it's a, it's a lot it's a lot of responsibility which is why i shirk it constantly um but but look I, let me bring the audience into the conversation here on this as well because i, I want them to know i mean we have been doing as, as you probably well know dr navarro i know you you've listened to my podcast for a while now and, and again that disturbs me is that you should you should be reliant on me in any way shape or form for for any information but i guess it's true in the sense that we do things differently here at the pulse you know we go after real documents real data real information um yeah. real hidden links all of that stuff which i think you know should be has traditionally been uh what the what the media looks for and goes after the old cliche now speaking truth to power doesn't really exist uh, in Washington, D.C. So what little we can do to make that happen, we do. Um, but I've also just, you know, not not been uh, particularly of the view right now that there is something to say about something every single day. We live in these times where, where it takes people like us a little longer to try and calculate and figure out what exactly is going on, whether it's pertaining to the Facebook whistleblower and the Facebook uh, uh, downtime situation. And now we're seeing at The Intercept all of these, uh, you know, leaked lists of groups that Facebook targets. Um, and you sit back and you look at all of these things put together and you go, huh, uh, either all of these coincidences have happened at the same time in the same week or there are some very, very smart public relations, public affairs actors working behind the scenes to victim to create a victimhood status for Facebook. And and I personally just sit down for prolonged periods of time now and try and think these things through and figure out, you know, what angles are we being played from? Because I think let's talk about your book and let's talk about Anthony Fauci. I think it did take, there were some people who were out there from the beginning, very smart and knew exactly what this man was all about, but it did take a lot of America a very long time. You know, we've got the Rasmussen polling up today uh, on the site that shows a, a majority of all Americans say Fauci has lost, quote, all credibility, all credibility. It took people a very long time to get there. So, so let's get into that. In Trump Time, your book, which I, I, I have a uh, for the National Pulse audience, you've got to go to this link. It's bit.ly, which is B-I-T dot L-Y, bit.ly forward slash Pulse Podcast. And I'll put the, uh, the link in the description of this podcast as well so people can grab themselves a copy. Dr. Navarro, your first interactions with Anthony Fauci, tell us all about them. Well, see, this is what's fascinating. I mean, I was I was literally the only guy in the administration who, from the very beginning, uh, would would publicly challenge uh, Fauci and also do it in places like the sit room. And I, I took tremendous heat for that. But every time I challenged him, I was on the right side of things. And the book, um, the second chapter of the book begins in the famous uh, White House Situation Room it's January 2020. Uh, the president has tasked me with the responsibility of bringing the White House Coronavirus Task Force over to his side in support of a ban on China travel, right? So airplanes from China into the U.S. were going to be banned. It was going to be stopped, right? So I walk into the, the sit room. It's in the, uh, the West Wing, the basement of the West Wing. Um, I walk in there and <clears throat> the big long table there, Mulvaney, the acting chief of staff is at the end of the table. He's going to be chairing the meeting. Um, on my left shoulder, I got uh, Pompeo's second in command, a truly scurrilous globalist who always like oh, disobeyed Pompeo. Um, cross from me at 11 o'clock, Redfield from the CDC and Azar. Uh, Health and Human Services Secretary, right? And I'm I'm looking around the room, assessing the situation. And there's this guy at high noon, right across from me. It would become symbolic. A uh, little guy with these with these round little glasses on. And within two minutes, Raheem, I'm in a literally a shouting match with this sob. <laughs> and I'm thinking to myself, like like Butch to Sundance, like who is this guy, right? And the the argument was simply that I was advocating. For the China travel ban, and he was he was insisting that travel bans don't work. So I'm going to the guy. I'm saying like like dude, and I called him dude. It's like 
like <clears throat> you mean to tell me if 20,000 Chinese nationals could coming in to New York and Chicago and L.A. every day and, and, and many of them are likely to have covid that that we shouldn't shut them out. And he just kept repeating the same thing over and over again. And, you know, little did I know that this was St. Fauci. Little did I know this was a guy you weren't supposed to challenge. Little did I know that he walked on water and knew everything, right? But my instinct... Remember, he is I the looked science. At him ...was that this guy thinks he's smarter than he is, and he is going to hurt the president and this country. And he was wrong about the travel ban. Uh, I went home and I wrote a memo as I document in the In Trump Time book that would change the course of that history, uh, describing how if we if we didn't have the travel ban, millions could die and trillions would be lost. And um, they, they'd turn the things around on a dime. But that would be just the first, Raheem, of many confrontations with this SOB. There is blood on his hands and he consistently tried to take down Donald J. Trump. Now. Dr. Navarro, presumably, you know, the New York Times magazine has reached out to you to do a feature called The Man Who Saved Millions of Americans. <laughs> talk about your prescience and come and do a lovely photo shoot at your house. Yeah. Is yeah. that right? Good good luck with that. And and by the way, Simon and Schuster did not come calling for my memoirs. Um, you know, I'm, I'm proud to say that that all seasons press. Uh, is the publisher. And who are they? They never published a book in their life before this one. But the people running all seasons were actually canceled from Simon and Schuster and Harper Collins because they had been the ones who previously had had uh, published conservative imprints. So no, <laughs> no, nobody's coming to call and to do these profiles. But that's again, I get to the six big guns of truth, like the National Pulse. Um, but here's the thing, Raheem. I wish, I wish like, you'd keep. Say, I wish you'd stop saying it because now I feel like I have to do more. <laughs> now I well, feel the weight of responsibility. Get off the butt here, like when, when, one last pint a day and one more hour of work, man. <laughs> when Doctor Navarro comes calling, you pick up the goddamn phone. Um, or have the pint while you're working. I don't. I you know. I don't know how you do it. But well, I am uh, doing sober October. You'll be pleased to hear, and it's going very okay. well. Yeah, so, well, yeah. I'm all for that. Yeah. we'll get you. Uh, We'll get you out on the mall uh, with Natalie and uh, running there. And, oh, uh, I, did, I did five miles this morning across the National Mall and back. It was, it was, you know, trying to get fitter, trying to trying to have break out the guns like like Doctor Navarro has on the Warham all the time. Let me <laughs> let me just. I got a follow up question for you on on, sure. on on that scene that you just introduced for us. It's yes. a, you know, uh, people people will kind of feel the tension in that room as you kind of look across the table and say, "Dude," and to give people a little bit of a teaser as well, you should. See the uh, new Fauci emails we're going to be releasing tomorrow morning. That's Wednesday morning, October the 13th. But Natalie Winters has got more emails uh, just showing the the flippancy of not just this man, but his wife, who is in charge of the you know bioethics, uh, as if that's not a major conflict of interest when, you're, when your husband is funding gain-of-function experiments uh, halfway around the world or the full way around the world. But I want to I go back into that room. When you walked in that room, when you sit on that chair and when you were looking across the table, what did it feel like for you in terms of uh, how seriously the, the impact of the CCP's virus, um, Peter Daszak's virus, Anthony Fauci's virus, um, did, did it feel like the room was ready to deal with that situation? No, absolutely not. Uh, they were they were living in uh, in fantasy land. Uh, at the end of that meeting, Raheem, what was really interesting about it is uh, Mulvaney, as the chief um, uh, of staff and and chair of the meeting, declares uh, there's a consensus in the room. Uh, we won't be imposing the travel ban. Wow. And as soon as he said that, I got right up in his face and said, Mick, there's no consensus in this room at all. And I document this in the In Trump Time book. Uh, Pottinger finally pipes up. He, he's a deputy um, NSC guy and says the NSC uh, supports the travel ban. And, and, the, and the meeting breaks up in chaos and everybody's pissed at me uh, for being the skunk at the table. Uh, but screw them. I went back and wrote that memo. But but what was interesting you know, to your point about about how out of touch these people were, the, the in Trump time book actually begins in chapter one uh, two weeks earlier in the East Wing. Raheem, I'm in the East Wing sitting in the audience watching uh, the vice premier Leo Ha of China 
signing this skinny deal with President Trump, right? And I'm sitting in the audience and I don't, I, I hardly ever sweat, right? But that day I'm in this cold sweat. Uh, why? Because 14 years earlier, I'd written a book called The Coming China Wars, which predicted that China would create a, a virus that would create a global pandemic and kill millions, right? So I'm sitting there. It, 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 I've been talking to Bannon. I've been talking to Miles Guo. I've been talking to Doc Hatfield. I know the crematoria are working overtime in Wuhan. I know that we've got a serious situation on our hands, right? And I'm looking up at that stage thinking to myself, what do these Chinese communists know that we don't? Are any of them infected? If they are, why are they sitting next to a, a, the president and the vice president? And Raheem, the last thing that comes into my mind is I'm, I'm seeing Chernobyl uh, in, in Pearl Harbor and the Twin Towers all roll by is whether or not this was a bioweapon designed to take down a sitting president. And so um, I, from the get go, man, I was I was ready to 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 make sure that we were ready for this. So I'm in the situation room on that January 28th day. And you know what, Raheem, on that same day, that son of a B, Fauci, you got say an it. email you can say from it. a guy at the Scripps Institute that basically told him that this was a genetically engineered virus, right? At that point, there was no doubt that Fauci knew that it was his money and his gain of function experiments that likely spawned that virus in that lab. Did he tell us? No. Did he try to cover that up? Yes. So, it's I mean, and that's just the beginning of the book. And I just throughout the, the book, I have multiple showdowns with the SOB and he needs to go down, Raheem. He needs to be be out of the NIH. He needs to be up on Capitol Hill, strapped into a chair, confessing his crimes and then putting an orange jumpsuit for lying to Congress about gain of function. By the way, you can you can swear all you like on this podcast. I'm a big uh, I'm a big fan of George Carlin. Seven words you're not allowed to say um, on television. So feel free that he is a son of a bitch, um, uh, Doctor Navarro. The the did 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 Fauci ever come forth to your understanding to to the amount of conversations you were privy to, or even any you know things that you heard secondhand and say, hey. I've been working with these guys, Dashak, the Wuhan lab. I know a lot of these people. I've sp spoken at conferences with them. Did he ever declare an interest and, and a self-interest um, in, in, in masquerading the truth from not just Americans, but the world? If, Raheem, if I had known what I know now back then, I could have blown that son of a bitch right out of the water. Did he say a single word about any? of that complicity? No. He lied by omission to the president of the United States, to the task force. Why is that important, Raheem? If we had known then what I know now about that virus and what Fauci knew, we would have adopted an entirely different strategy. We would have been much more aggressive with communist China, forcing them to release data. And hundreds of thousands of Americans would be alive today if Fauci had come clean and not pursued a cover-up. That man is the most evil man I have ever seen in American political life. And the fact that he's still in office is 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 a crime in and of itself. His 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 accomplice in crime, Francis Collins, has resigned in disgrace in no small part to efforts like the National Pulse. Fauci needs to be next, but he keeps doubling and tripling down on his lies. Well, I mean, at this point in time, he kind of has no no other option, right? I mean, the the the, the crook now has to just keep denying and denying. Uh, otherwise, the punishment's going to be even worse. But as you say, I mean, with Dr. Rand uh, Paul chasing this down, as well as many others, I happen to believe that justice is around the corner for people like that. It certainly hit uh, Francis Collins, and I think it's coming for Anthony Fauci too, as his, as his public poll numbers decline, and as more emails and more information comes out about not just his role uh, in this whole uh, pandemic, but, but for the last... 10, 20, 30 years. And I, I have a question for you in that regard. I've said on this podcast before, and I've, I've been fairly exasperated about this point. 
The US government, along with other governments around the Western world, have ploughed billions, with a B, tens of billions, with a B, into what has been known for the last several decades as quote-unquote pandemic preparedness. Was there any preparedness ahead of the pandemic? No, we were, we were caught with our inventories down. I mean, look, um, pandemics are black swan events. Uh, and going back to the Clinton years through Bush and Obama, Biden, whenever on Capitol Hill there was a discussion about increasing funding for that pandemic preparedness, it never got done. So well, we, we as an administration were certainly equally guilty of that, but uh, within the context of, of that history, it's perhaps an excusable sin. But the point here is not to be an apologist for the administration, but in the book in Trump time, I simply describe how we got fast out of the gate in the very bad circumstances on January 29th and 30th with the president acting. And then what's really interesting about the book and the first part of in Trump time Raheem is is my 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 dozen memos in February, which basically got the ball rolling on the vaccines and therapeutics like monoclonal antibodies and remdesivir, and which made sure every American had a ventilator. Uh, and even as we were doing it, there's a there's a, there's a funny little story um, in the uh, in one of the chapters about these memos where when everybody was trying to blame Trump for us not, not being prepared in February, I had these memos which were exculpatory and it was like, you know, I couldn't, couldn't uh, give them away to uh, Maggie Haberman at the New York Times. Uh, Axios wouldn't touch it, this, that, and the other thing. And that was, that was the central problem we had, Raheem, to blame China was to not blame Trump. And that did not fit in with the central narrative of either the Democrats uh, or their media and CNBC and MSNBC or the rhino Republicans who control a good part of the voice of, of the conservative networks um, and who really abhor tr Trump economic nationalism. So um, that's 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 the in Trump time tale. It's it's a tragedy. It's a comedy. It's a book of indictments. It's a book of revelations. But I do think it acts as a foundation for all of the great journalism you're doing and, and the, the big, uh, big six guns of truth are doing because I was there from the inside. I can provide testimony to and, and texture to the kinds of stories you're releasing now. Um, about uh, people uh, like uh, Fauci or what's going on with the FBI on Capitol Hill and everything in between. I just don't know where... I, the, the, the frustration for me, Dr. Navarro, is I just don't know where all these tens of billions of dollars in pandemic preparedness went. I, I suspect we may never know. Um, but, you know, it, it does occur to me... Well, let me, let me I, I tell you, once, 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 uh, once, once we put our shoulder to the wheel... Um, I, I spent a, a men, you know, 24/7 uh, working, for example, on the ventilator issue. I mean, mm -hmm. we were able to uh, stand up a factory in 17 days to make ventilators. It's, wow. uh, it's it's never been done before. Never will be done. For again, I used a lot of the money that was spent um, to get domestic production, so we wouldn't have to rely on um, offshore supply chains. But the, 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 the money that we threw at that, uh, the trillions upon trillions of other dollars, um, I can assure you that there was a lot of that money uh, went, went to uh, places that it shouldn't have gone and, and likely some of it got stolen or corruption. There needs to be accounting of that. But no, I'm just I, look. Yeah, I'm talking. I want to send a bill to communist China, <laughs> not to the White House or Congress at this point. But I, I and I agree with you. I'm not talking about the money that you guys spent. I mean, you know, Joe Biden and and Anthony Blinken will will you know, talk out of their asses for, for, for years about how, you know, Afghanistan was the biggest logistical success in American history. That was not true in any way, shape or form. But what may have been the greatest logistical success was what you describe in the early days of the pandemic, you know, putting the aircraft carrier and the medical ships everywhere, the ventilators issue, everything was, was you know, and I was watching it with kind of a front row seat, um, was, was 
you know, the 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 greatest lift, I think, since, since uh, you know, uh, the Marshall Plan, quite frankly. But I'm talking about the decades before this pandemic yeah. occurred, you know, where, have, where is, because I've been through the documents, I've been through the data, and every annual report, every financial statement shows billions upon billions going into quote unquote pandemic preparedness. But when the time came, as you say, there was we very little enough- in terms of preparedness. You know, it's right. It's interesting you say that because I think um, I think when push came to shove, uh, the biggest failure uh, was certainly not President Trump. Um, it was the failure of all of our healthcare bureaucracy leadership to come forward with an actual plan right. and the resources to back it. Right. I mean, if you look at at Azar, you look at Han. You look at Redfield, you look at Fauci, you look at Rick Bright, you look at Janet Woodcock. These people, that that was their job, right? And they had a lot of money to do that job. But when push came to shove, Raheem, I'd sit in the Oval Office with the president. They'd be sitting there. They had nothing. They had absolutely nothing to offer to the conversation. And so we had to start from scratch and do stuff in Trump time, which is to say as quickly as possible. The story I tell in, in Trump time about the vaccine in and of itself is a classic because uh, two things I think stand out. I mean, we did it in a third of the time. I had to fight Fauci all the way on that. But Raheem, never my wildest dreams when I was working on the memo to jumpstart warp speed that I dreamed that, that the vaccines would be turned into a weapon against the American worker. I mean, it's just uh, cultural wars, social wars, economic wars now with you with Biden using the vaccine to essentially turn America into communist China had no clue. And that's why elections have consequences and stolen elections have catastrophic consequences, because I can tell you that if if President Trump were still in the White House, uh, we wouldn't be having either the economic problems or the fascism that we're observing now. Well, I'm glad you bring up the vaccines because, uh, you know, I think I think a lot of people, you know, we hear you on the war room very often and, and we talk about the efficacy of Operation Warp Speed and getting those vaccines produced faster than, than anybody thought. I mean, I remember the, frankly, anti-vax sentiment that came from MSNBC anchors and Daily Beast articles and uh, left-wing Twitter users who were openly saying if anybody's stupid enough to take these trump vaccines then you deserve what's coming to you they're all now of course advocating for mandates that are putting people out of work mandates that are making people sick mandates that are shoving uh, needles into the arms of children and i i i want to put the question to you how do you feel about your your uh your work that you did that was obviously in in good faith and good spirit to get vaccines produced for those who really need them being turned into because you have traditionally been a, a you know one of the staunchest supporters of working class America that there has ever been and and how does it feel for you seeing some of your work twisted and bastardized and wrecking people's lives? Raheem, there's there's politics, there's brass knuckles politics, and 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 that stuff I can abide by, mm. but when Americans are dying by the tens of thousands because of political decisions made by people who hate Trump more than they love this country. Uh, I'm, I'm outraged. Uh, and one of the reasons why um, I wrote the book in Trump time, one of the reasons why I speak out frequently on the war room, one of the reasons why I'm, we're talking today is that we, we've got to come to terms um, with this absolute craziness. I mean, like go back to February 2020 when I'm writing these memos. I mean, the strategy which I laid out on behalf of the president was was what I called the five vector attack strategy. And you know, you had your PPE and all that stuff. But the two main things to deal with the virus itself was a vaccine, but also therapeutics. And working with Doc Hatfield, who's a real hero in the book. Um, we recognized early on that the vaccine would be imperfect and that uh, we would need uh, flooding the zone of easy and cheap therapeutics that people could take in the first seven days of infection. Little, little magic pill 
take these pills and and you can moderate symptoms, take death off the table. And and that was the strategy that we should have pursued. That was a strategy that we should pursue even today. But what was what was so um, homicidal about Zucker and CNN and Fauci is that they simultaneously act to delay the vaccine coming in until after the election for purely political purposes. People die because of that. But but the worst thing they did, Raheem, was to destroy the credibility of arguably the most effective therapeutic we have in our medicine cabinet today, and that's hydroxychloroquine. Now, when I say those words, there's going to be some people in your audience who are going to go, wow, go crazy, roll out, whatever. Mm. But that's what they did to you with hydroxy hysteria, the whole chapter seven. And in Trump time, I lay the whole thing out. I show now that the science on that therapeutic is undeniable. It saves lives, cuts the mortality rate, takes death off the table. But the confluence of a big pharma wanting to push vaccines and expensive drugs, coupled with the Democrats wishing to take Donald Trump down, um, basically killed the use of therapeutics. I mean, you can't you can't go in, you, even if your doctor prescribes ivermectin or hydroxy, both of which are, are effective therapeutics, you can't go into a pharmacy like a CVS or Walgreens and get it because of the madness of Tony Fauci, Stephen Hahn, Janet Woodcock, Joe Biden, CNN, Zucker. These people have killed hundreds of thousands of Americans with their political attack on the president without regard for science or data or sanity. So, Dr. Var, I know, I know we've got, uh, we're short on time here now, but I, I really do want to ask you about your view um, uh on the origin of the virus. Uh, you mentioned it right at the top, and you mentioned your, your thought process and, and thinking of uh, you know, prior attacks on, um, on the United States. In, in your estimation, was this, was this a bioweapon? Was it a, you know, an experiment gone wrong? Was it intentionally released or was it accidentally released? When I, um, when I uh, publicly stated back in February 2020 that the virus almost certainly came from the Wuhan lab. And predictably, I was excoriated uh, for that by the mainstream media. But today, it is the conventional wisdom that that, that virus is indeed uh, from the lab, that it likely was the product of Tony Fauci's gain-of-function experiments and ironically funded by the American taxpayer. Now, to the question of whether... Uh, China intentionally attacked America. Well, what I do in, in the In Trump Time book, I, I have a whole chapter on what I what I what I um, define as speculative blame versus intentional blame, right? And the speculative blame is to this question of whether it was intentionally released from the lab, but the intentional blame is really sufficient to convict communist China of the crime of attacking America. And the, the intentional blame boils down to the fact that once the virus got out of the lab, no matter how, whether it was intentional or not, China failed to contain that virus. And not only that, it seeded and spreaded the world with the virus by sending its hundreds of thousands of Chinese nationals around the country. And then even as it was doing that, it was vacuuming up all the PPE all around the world. So you, you knew that China knew there was a pandemic. So you put those heinous attacks together and that's enough, Raheem, it, it, whether it was an accident or not, that's enough alone to convict China of the murder of American citizens and the destruction of the American economy. It's enough to hold communist China accountable for what it did, along with Anthony Fauci for his complicity in that. So um, there, there's a very textured analysis in the book in Trump time. Um, people will, will find the more details in it, but that's kind of the top line. Well, I am so I am so grateful for you uh, taking the time to talk to us today and, and grateful for you taking the time 
to write this book. I'm going through um, the Woodward Costa book right now, Peril, and I've got to tell you, I mean, it is, I don't know if you've even looked into it, but it's one of the poorest written uh, propaganda exercises I've ever seen, but I'm gripped um, by the lack of integrity in this thing. It's just, it's stunningly, stunningly bad. And I think that is the juxtaposition between, you know, the work that you're putting out and the work that's coming out of the uh, the establishment media and the establishment, uh, uh, um, you know, corporate classes at the moment is you see it all over the place. You know, you, they, they half ass everything because they really don't really feel like they even need to mask things that much now. Look at Francis Horgan, the Facebook whistleblower and all these other things. Uh, but a big failure on on our side, and I'm I'm like you. I'm not a I'm not a committed partisan in any way, right? Like my my party is the truth. My party is 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 real news, and what we do over here at the Pulse. And I know you feel similarly too. Um, and I just think you know, there's no there's no better um, sunlight uh, uh, that works as a disinfectant than the words of of Dr. Peter Navarro. The book is called In Trump Time. Uh, you can get it at uh, bit.ly, that's B-I-T dot L-Y forward slash Pulse Podcast. And that link will be in the podcast description for you, ladies and gentlemen, as well. Dr. Navarro, what else is there to say? But thank you. Thank you so much for what you do. And thank you so much for joining us here today. Hey, thanks so much, Raheem. And as a bonus, I'll tell you that in Chapter uh, 2, I take down Woodward and expose him for the liar and propagandist he is. That's just a bonus in the book. Amazing. Amazing. Thank you, Dr. Navarro. Thank you. Have a great day. Cheers. All right, man. Cheers. Take care. Thank you. It's always wonderful to have people like uh, like Dr. Navarro on the show. Um, and we spoke together, in fact, on a panel at AmpFest this last weekend at the Trump Doral in Miami. It was equally, equally eloquent and impressive. So I want to make sure we all go to that URL Check it out in the description and uh, and support Dr. Navarro and support the new publisher, by the way, that is taking the um, taking the challenge head on. Having been cancelled themselves, as people who have worked in the book industry for decades, by the way, uh, All Seasons Press is the name of the publisher. Make sure you check that out. And again, the URL is bit.ly forward slash pulse podcast. Now... A lot of people have been uh, sliding into my DMs and asking me a lot of personal questions um, and a lot of uh, a lot of private questions uh, about my whereabouts and what I'm working on and what I'm doing and why am I not on the war room anymore? And so I just think um, I just think I'll address that for a minute for those of you who are concerned that there is some big conspiracy or falling out or anything like that. Listen, <laughs> I have worked with. Steve Bannon for, oh, I don't even know what year it is, it's 2021, so for nearly 10 years now, and um, we've worked on and off together, you know, for a very long time, uh, Breitbart and the radio shows, and I was kind of a uh, sometimes there, sometimes not there character for that, and then obviously when he went into the White House, but then after the White House, we we got the band back together and uh, toured Europe, and then we didn't do anything together for a while, and then we came back and did the War Room Impeachment. That was the original show, War Room Impeachment, for those of you that don't know. And, um, you know, we've we've been doing that stuff for nearly two years, two years now. And it's just one of those things where we've, we've cycled we've cycled back into a position whereby I don't want to be spending hours uh, in the War Room every day, especially because... As a lot of you know, Steve has far much more to say than I do. Um, and me spending three hours uh, of my mornings in there, and I'm maybe I'm talking for what ten minutes max over the course of two hours. Um, I just, I just, I don't want to necessarily do that. And I think he respects the fact that you know the pulse is growing in and of itself. I'm working on several different, very, very exciting and different projects at the moment. Um, you know, we've obviously got undergone a massive website change. We're trying to grow the membership, which, by the way, you can join to support us at fundrealnews.com. That's fundrealnews.com. That'll be in the description as well. Um, and I just want you all to know that there's no animosity. There is, there is, there are two grown men who who are doing lots of different things, and sometimes we converge and sometimes we don't. And frankly, frankly, I mean. <sighs> Dr. Navarro said it there himself almost. He said, Jack Posobiec over at Human Events. Well, I was the one who negotiated 
for human events to be purchased away from who owned it before Salem I think Salem Eagle Publishing so that it could grow into what Jack is growing it into so my my role in all of this is much more as a kind of um behind the scenes um you know supporting character uh than it is necessarily somebody who's on camera or, on, or at the microphone every day I, believe it or not um, this is not something I particularly enjoy doing. Not even the podcast is something I particularly enjoy doing. I only do it when I feel like there is either something I can bring to the equation that is different um, or someone that I think I can get, you know, specifically different answers from and a different interview from and, and create value and add value for for you, the listener, the person whose life this is all this all this craziness is affecting. I don't particularly love being up on panels. I don't particularly love uh, giving public speeches, but I, I, I do it when it is when I think there is a moral imperative uh, for me to do it. I was Nigel Farage's, you know, backroom boy. I was behind the scenes. I would write the op-eds and report the news to him and, and help with political strategy. And that, that's really what I prefer to do. Um, and I think, I think I just wanted to let you guys know. I mean, Steve and I were texting a bunch this afternoon there's no there's no problem there's no you know uh, falling out and look Natalie can go on there and Terry Schilling can go on there and Posobiec can go on there and I you know I'm not going to call Posobiec one of my protégés but but certainly I think Terry and Natalie and a lot of the other people that go on there would, would fit into that category so it's just great for me to know that I can sit here at my desk and be doing the news which I love um, and doing the, the research and doing, you would not believe how much administrative work goes into keeping the pulse alive and active. And, you know, we have the Discord live chat, we have um, our mailing lists, we have our uh, push notification system in your browser, we have, you know, I copy edit every article myself, which is probably why you're thinking, oh, yeah, that's a, I saw a typo. Um, you know, I do all of those things. Believe me. Um, if I had the time in the day, I would love to sit in that studio and just hang out. But I just, I don't have the time in the day. And I want you to know that, it, <laughs> that it's all good. Like, we're all chill. So um, I just want to fill you in on a few other things in the meantime. Um, working, uh, obviously, we did the AmpFest conference this past weekend. So great to have uh, time with with our good friends and, and brothers in arms, like Congressman Gates and Jack Posobiec and um Darren Beatty and so many of the other people who are at that conference and up on stage there and I want you to go and go to their website americanpriority.com and make sure that you're aware of the next thing that they put together because I want to see you there and I want to meet you and I met so many war room fans and I met so many national pulse supporters and it just it that is the stuff that drives me that is the stuff I had a conversation on the phone with one of our lifetime members yesterday those are the moments that, that keep us going, is talking to you guys and meeting you guys and hugging you guys and, and knowing, because it's, it's a very lonely existence in Washington, D.C., as a, as a not just a conservative, but a, a conservative that really pisses most other conservatives off, right? I mean, I sit here just a couple of blocks away from the Heritage Foundation. I don't get invited to Heritage Foundation events anymore. I don't even get invited to, you know, the American Conservative Gala, I don't get invited to the Daily Caller events. I, they don't like us because they know that at a dime we might turn on them. Why? Because we're not interested in, in, in partisanship. We're not interested in camaraderie for the sake of it. We're not interested in making friends in this town. The old phrase goes, you want a friend in D.C., get a dog. Um, I don't have a dog because I don't want any friends in D.C. Um, and so we are proudly persona non grata not just at left-wing things but also at conservative ink things and i just want everybody to understand that when i say i fight for you and i fight for the truth i mean that i mean that and here's another thing i think that a lot of people got a little upset with me about the other day on twitter and i want to i want to add some context to it um Posobiec has been talking about how Mike Pompeo is going to run for president. Well, that's obvious. <laughs> He's lost like a thousand pounds in weight. He's obviously going to run for president. He's on the television all the time. He's going to these meetings and events all the time. He's losing weight. He's speaking like a leader. Um, and fine, as, as far as I'm concerned. I don't want to see a coronation of anyone anywhere in the UK, in the US, I think a primary contest 
And, you know, saying, if, if any of these candidates want to stand on that stage with Donald Trump and say, hey, man, like, how come you made such bad hires? Or how come you endorsed candidates who hate you and your agenda? I think you benefit from that. You know, I'm not saying that he shouldn't be the um, candidate. I think we're all probably in agreement that he, he will be, barring some crazy thing that happens. But why not? Why act like cultist leftists? Why not have a full, frank, honest, open primary? And I couldn't give a flying fuck about, Pete, uh, about Mike Pompeo. Right, I just I, I I'm not I'm not into it, <laughs> but I am into I am into debate and I am into conversation and I am into critical thinking and this is a podcast for critical thinkers, this is a podcast for independent thinkers. This isn't a podcast for 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 nodding dogs and yes men. We don't do that here, um, and so I just want you to know it's not an anti-Trump position in the slightest. I sit before you here staring at the picture of me and Donald Trump and Nigel Farage up in his apartment two days after he won that election in 2016. That is what I am looking at right now. You can Google it. It's a great picture. <laughs> I am probably 100 pounds fatter in that picture. Um, so don't don't interpret it as, as, as anti-Trumpism or never Trumpism or anything like that. It's not that. It's not that. You know, I just had Dr. Navarro on the show talking up, talking up Trump and his Operation Warp Speed and his reaction to all of this. It's just to say that that we have to get to the bottom of everything. We have to understand, like, I want somebody up there on stage asking him, hey, um, Mr. President, why, when all of these people, Bannon, Kassam, everybody out there, Fredericks, uh, Solomon, all of these people were talking in advance of the election about the poorly run nature of the campaign, and specifically the poorly addressed uh, mail-in vote debacle, why did we kind of march into that election with rose-tinted glasses on and expect it to all be okay? Why wasn't there a full canvas immediately after the election? Why, Mr. President, did you not go to the prison in D.C. and hold a rally outside there for the people who are, who are still wrongly incarcerated from January the 6th. And I know they're tough questions. I know they're not nice questions. I'm not trying to be nasty. They are honest and open questions that need to be asked of anybody that you put your faith in, ever. You would not allow any other candidate to duck those questions. And I don't think you should let Donald Trump duck those questions either. And I think his demeanor is changing now. These, I, I think I said on the last podcast that I don't really listen to the television interviews or the radio interviews does anymore because it was so much of the same for so long. And I think he's graduating from that. I think he's, frankly, was still shell-shocked until about a month ago about the election and about what happened to him. Um, and I think you heard from the Alabama rally that the, the, the tune is now changing that he is now focusing a lot more laser-like focus on things that actually really, really deeply matter, rather than, rather than complaining about the injustices of the past, moving on. You know, it's that, it's that um, St. Augustine quote that I'm sure you've seen on my Instagram page, and I say so often, right? It's hope has two beautiful daughters, anger and courage. Anger at the way things are, and courage to see that they do not remain the way they are. And I think he's getting that, he's getting that courage back. He's getting that forward looking, I'm gonna take the fight to them rather than let the fight come to me approach. And guess what? Guess what? It's absolutely fine if you disagree with me. That is okay too. And I am big enough and ugly enough. To deal with that, we have an absolute treasure trove of unique investigative reporting up on the nationalpulse.com, ladies and gentlemen. And I urge you, nay, implore you, nay, I beseech you to not just go to the nationalpulse.com and click on a few stories and click on the in Trump time advertisements and the getter.com bars and join getter because I'm on there every day and I love the community on there 
but send it to your friends. Send 10 articles from The Pulse to your friends. Send 20. Email them. Text them. Let's do this. Let's take Western civilization back together. I want to say a great big thank you to all the members that have joined recently. Vicky, Peter, Michael, Mark, Linda, Angela, Dave, Martha, Cheryl, Richard, Van, Ellen, Julie, Nancy, Leshek, Carol, M.W., Robert, Catherine, Thomas, Susan, Christopher, Jason, Angie, Ray, Aunt Rayanne, Brian, G, Elizabeth, Stephanie, Ian, Carmela, Gloria, Eva, Christine, John, William, Jody, Donald, Aaron, Stephen, you all went over, took action into your own hands. Enough just funding politicians and think tanks. You took action to go to fundrealnews.com and I thank you for that. Links in the bio. Get in Trump time. Get on Getter. Fundrealnews.com and I'll see you again real soon.